Hey everybody, so in this video, I'm going to discuss what we do when we introspect, specifically what we do when we start reflecting on ourselves. And so this video is primarily going to be about something called objective awareness theory, or sorry, objective self-awareness theory, sometimes just referred to as self-awareness theory. So I'm going to show you my PowerPoint presentation so you can follow along. Alrighty. All right. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about objective self-awareness theory, also just called self-awareness theory. Now, <clears throat> this theory proposed by Duvall and Wicklin argued that <clears throat> when we are kind of in the moment, uh, we're not really reflecting on ourselves, rather we're just kind of experiencing the things going on or the things that we're experiencing in the moment, we call, they call that kind of self-awareness subjective self-awareness. And that is distinct from the type of self-awareness we experience when we begin reflecting on ourselves, when we begin engaging in introspection. Specifically, we tend to, when we engage in self-reflection, we tend to introspect, when we tend to focus on ourselves, we engage in what they called objective self-awareness. <clears throat> Now, when we engage in this objective self-awareness, Duvall and Wicklin argued that we begin to compare ourselves to certain internal standards. And these internal standards would involve the traits, the abilities, the attitudes, all of the qualities that we would associate with what we might think of as the correct person. All right. And so <clears throat> we might have this kind of representation of what people should think, what they should do, and what they should be able, be able to do. And when we engage in self-reflection, when we engage in self-awareness, and we begin to, or objective self-awareness, and we begin to reflect on ourselves, <clears throat> Duvall and Wicklin say, we, says, say that we compare ourselves to these internal standards. Now, in general, Duvall and Wicklin argued that self-awareness would generally be aversive, meaning it, it generally wouldn't be comfortable because they suggested that almost everybody, and presumably this is true, almost everybody is going to have at least one uh, internal standard that they don't meet. They're going to have something that they have uh, failed to accomplish. And realizing that, becoming aware of that unachieved dream or unachieved uh, uh, standard can be aversive. And so Duvall and Wicklin argued that <clears throat> people would often avoid self-awareness. Now, that general premise has actually been, was in fact, it was probably one of the uh, first uh, revisions of objective awareness theory because object, uh, objective awareness can be a positive experience. Specifically, oh, come on now, when we find that we are meeting our standards, all right, when we find that we're meeting the standards that we're currently focused on, then uh, engaging in objective self-awareness can be pleasant because we realize, hey, I'm meeting my goals. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the things that I've set out to do. Um, and, you know, later work found that the rate at which you're completing or meeting those standards also is also important. So if you're not only meeting your standards, but you're meeting them maybe even at a faster rate than you had originally expected, then objective self-awareness can be pleasant. Um, <clears throat> but if you become aware of a, a, a standard that you don't meet, then this means you are in some way discrepant from this standard. And we this, this kind of inconsistency uh, in some circles is referred to a self discrepancy, a self discrepancy. There's something discrepant about who you are. All right. Now, <clears throat> remember, just as a quick jump back, that the self is a mental representation of you. So we each have a self and it is a representation of who we are. It contains all of our self knowledge. And this is different from our identity. Our identity is part of the self, but it's not the whole self. All right. Um, but certainly the self will largely define the, the identity because your identity is you know, what qualities you, you assume you have, uh, what you associate. Sorry, my 
dog has decided to play with his squeaky toy while I'm lecturing. Uh, uh, what things you associate with yourself uh, and the self-concept <clears throat> uh, is basically everything you know about you, all right? Your memories, your knowledge about yourself, your experiences, it's, it's all your self-knowledge, all right? So certainly the two are very closely tied, but they aren't exactly the same idea. Now, back to what happens if we don't meet our standards. Well, as um, Dole and Wicklin originally assumed, you find, if you find that you don't meet one of your standards, that's a negative state. That's a negative, uh, aversive state. We don't like that. And that, that challenges both our desire to feel good about ourselves. that's our esteem, regard, also sometimes known as our enhancement motive, <clears throat> and it challenges our consistency motive. It means that we're inconsistent with who we think we should be, all right, or who we, with who we want to be. All right, and that distinction between should and want will come back uh, later in a later video. But the point remains, when we find that we have not met our standards, this challenges our esteem because it becomes a little harder to evaluate ourselves positively if we're not living up to our standards. And it can challenge our consistency motive because it, again, we don't feel good, we tend to feel dissonant or a negative uh, adversive arousal when we realize that we are inconsistent with who we want to be or who we feel we should be. So how do people react to these standards, specifically when we find that we are not consistent with our uh, internal standards? Well, <clears throat> in general, how we react depends on two things. One, efficacy. How effective do we believe we will be at resolving our discrepancies? How effective do we be, or do we believe that we will be at changing and meeting and meeting our standards? If we think that we're going to be able to do that, then so if self-efficacy is high, then we tend to react with resolution. We tend to try and meet that standard. But if we tend to think that we won't be effective at resolving uh, that or meeting that standard. We don't, we, we don't think we have the ability or we think there's too much stuff in the way or not, or uh, uh, you know, some, somebody else has control over it rather than we do. If, we, if, if, if for some reason we believe that we don't, aren't going to, are not going to be effective at resolving that discrepancy, at meeting that standard, and those two things, just to clear that up, are the same thing. Resolving a discrepancy and meeting a standard are the same thing. You resolve, you resolve a discrepancy by meeting the standard. You meet a standard by resolving a discrepancy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> now, so if you think you can do it, you try to resolve it. If you don't think you can do it, on the other hand, if you don't think you can do it, you avoid it, all right? And those are, in general, the two ways we, we, uh, Duvall and Wicklund thought we reacted to coming face to face with standards that we haven't met. We either try to resolve it or we avoid it. Now, again, in a later video, I'll get into how that gets far more complex than just simply resolve, attempting to resolve or to avoid. But for now, we'll just focus on those general classes. So the first thing it depends on how you react to discovering an unmet standard or a discrepancy. Uh, it depends on how effective you think you will be at, at meeting that standard. The second thing it depends on is how far away from that standard you feel you are. So how big is that discrepancy? Where are you in relation to that standard? You know, if you want to be, <clears throat> if, you, if you think a person should be ambitious, right, and you have never taken a chance in your life, you shy away from every opportunity, every time to every chance to take a risk that might further yourself, then you might find, well, I'm pretty, I, I'm too far. That, that, the discrepancy between how ambitious I really am and how ambitious, I, how ambitious I would like to be, that distance is too great. I am too far away from that standard. If that happens, if we find that we're too far away from our standard, then we tend to avoid the standard. We tend to just drop it. We tend to not think about it. But, if we find that the discrepancy is fairly small, that we're that the meeting the standard is within reach, then 
we're more likely to try and resolve uh, that discrepancy and try to meet that standard. And so to try and kind of sum it all up, it largely boils down to how successful you expect to be at meeting that standard. All right. All right, everybody, that is this, that is it for this video in which I'm dis in which I discussed uh, objective awareness theory or some um, objective self-awareness theory or sometimes just self-awareness theory. We talked about the basic ideas of the theory. Uh, we talked about <clears throat> what a discrepancy and what an internal standard is, and we talked about ways people uh, react to discovering those standards. All right. All right, guys, that's it for this video. As always, if you have any questions, send them my way. But if not, have a great one. I'll see you next time.